Good morning. Um, I'm going to tell you today about how we are pushing the envelope in tree genetics using modern um, genomic technologies. This is work that is done at the Forest Molecular Genetics Program at the University of Pretoria. So the Forest Molecular Genetics Program is a joint venture of uh, South African forestry companies and also government funding agencies. So we have the two major uh, pulp and paper companies, SAPI and Mondi. We have um, the uh, solid wood uh, producing companies like York Timbers and SAFCO, and also small grower associations like, like um, uh, NCT. Now, um, the FMG program consists of uh, over 50 young people that all share a passion for tree biology. So uh, our mission is to train tomorrow's science leaders as a, a group of four academics. And we work together to gain a fundamental understanding of tree biology. So um, this information can be used then to develop practical tree biotechnology applications. And these can range from DNA fingerprinting to molecular breeding that is employed towards enhanced growth and wood properties and resilience to uh, pests and pathogens. Now, if we think about the genetic improvement um, of long-lived plants like forest, fruit, and, and nut trees, we have to realize that most of these plants are still essentially undomesticated. This is in contrast to domesticated food crops uh, like the grains, some of which have been cultivated and selected for hundreds or thousands of generations even. So most planted tree crops are only a few generations, even, even just one generation removed from the wild. This means that they carry most of the genetic diversity of their wild relatives. And this is a huge advantage for us in, in that we can make rapid genetic progress if we select and breed the best genetic variation. This is something that DNA-based technologies can assist us with. So the reality is actually that trees have more in common with humans than they have uh, with, uh, out, with, um, with annual crop plants. And that is because like humans, they are also long-lived and outbred. So as tree geneticists, we look towards uh, advances in human genetics as well as crop genetics when we design strategies for genetic improvement. So the question really at this point is, what can we do to accelerate the domestication and the genetic improvement of forest trees? Today, I want to talk about four step changes that are happening in forestry genetics that can also accelerate fruit and nut tree improvement. The first of these uh, um, step changes is the ability to now routinely sequence tree genomes. Until recently, that was not tractable, but now we are able to do that. So this provides us with a blueprint for genetic improvement. It allows us to think differently about uh, tree breeding. Uh, as an example, I show the uh, eucalyptus grandis. So this is, uh, was the first reference genome for uh, eucalyptus trees. And I was involved as one of the, the lead investigators in that process. So just to give you an idea of the size, the genome is 640 million bases. So it's sort of a medium size of a tree genome that is organized into 11 chromosomes. And for macadamia, that would be very similar, 750 million uh, bases that's organized into 14 chromosomes. So routine sequencing of tree genomes has become feasible due to the development of a variety of automated DNA sequencing technologies. I won't be able to go into those technical details, but this has been driven mostly by the quest to sequence the human genome for less than $1,000. So we have, uh, we have really benefited from, from that uh, improvement. So the latest generation which we are using now um, can directly read off the sequence of the nucleotides as long DNA molecules are passed through thousands of nanopores. And this is very important because we can then use uh, powerful software and com competing infrastructure to find the overlaps between these long DNA sequences. And like uh, building a giant puzzle, we can then reassemble the full set of maternal and paternal chromosomes carried by each tree. So this is revolutionary in terms of tree breeding because it means that all of the genetic diversity that, we, um, that are present in a parental population can be tracked into the progeny um, in breeding trials uh, of these trees. And the good news is that the same technology is being currently being used to sequence uh, the macadamia genome. So Mary Hanketse is a PhD student uh, in my lab, so I'm hosting her PhD study. Um, and she's doing a study on uh, sequencing the macadamia genome. So there's some prior work already out of Australia 
the macadamia integri flora, uh, flora uh, genome was sequenced already and also out of, uh, out of uh, China with the, um, the tetraphylla genome. So Mary will be uh, building on top of that. She will be se sequencing uh, two uh, cultivars, Santa Ana, and also a hybrid Bowman. And this will be to complement the existing uh, genomic uh, resources, but also um, to be able to then apply it to determine the genomic composition of the most widely planted South African cultivars. And I think this will be a major advance for us to understand, especially because many of the varieties are in fact hybrids. So the second step uh, change really is then to be able to identify all the genes rapidly that are in tree genomes. So for the Eucalyptus genome, that turned out to be in the order of 36,000 genes. And the estimates now for the macadamia genome is anywhere from 32,000 to 34,000. So these, uh, these genes provide the building blocks for the growth, development, and defense machinery uh, of the trees. And there's, there's really two uh, general approaches that we can use to identify these trees or these genes in, in trees. In, in forward genetics, we make use of the natural genetic variation that's in the tree species. So we look at populations of trees, typically tree breeding populations, and we then map those to the genome and we can find in the genome which genes might be important for each of the traits. And we've done this for a variety of traits, starting from flowering all the way through wood formation. In reverse genetics, as soon as we have the genome, we can then start looking at specific genes and make changes in those genes, and then look in reverse how that affects growth and development of the trees. So I, I just show one example here of a project like that. So if we peel the bark of a tree, um, you would be exposing the living part of the wood, and that is the cambium. And we can scrape uh, the cambium and isolate um, RNA. And then we can identify which of the 36,000 genes in the tree are turned on in this tissue. And from that, we can infer, we can get a tissue, an organ-specific profile of what is happening, what, is, what biology is turned on, the metabolic processes that are involved in the development um, uh, and the physiology of that uh, tissue or organ. This can be done in fruits and nuts in, in flower development. It can also be done, we are routinely doing it for pest and pathogen interactions with the trees and also uh, for abiotic stresses such as drought and cold stress. The, the third step is since we now can sequence multiple tree genomes or hundreds of tree genomes in essence, we can also start looking at gene variants. So for every gene, we can look at what variant is carried in every particular uh, tree. And that's really the stuff of molecular breeding. So that's what we are trying to select, are favorable combinations of genes for different traits. So having complete genome sequences for all of the breeding parents in a population gives us an overview of all gene variants that are there. So in this slide, it shows an example of a number of breeding lines and it shows different genes or the, the Hs, they show haplotypes, which is equivalent to a gene. And we can track that now using the genome sequencing and also DNA markers, as I will explain. Um, the other uh, important insight is that sequencing tree genomes, again, coming back to human genetics, is much more similar to personal uh, genomes, uh, such as is used in human applications, such as cancer, cancer screening, because every tree has a unique combination of, of genes uh, that it has inherited from its uh, uh, pollen parent and also its seed parent. So we've already embarked on this process of, of personalized genomics for trees. We produced the first personalized genomes for eucalyptus trees at the University of Pretoria. And, and Mary, the PhD student, is working on the first personalized genome. And, and um, the, the, the truth of it is that we will have to produce many such genomes because every tree will have a unique uh, genetic makeup. So as we can, as I show here in, in this figure, the, the conceptual change that we can now make is that we can select uh, specific combinations of gene variants that then combine uh, desirable traits such as growth, wood properties, or defense, um, and that can then be used in developing new varieties. So at the University of Pretoria, um, we are establishing a precision tree breeding platform. It starts with high throughput robotics. Uh, which we use to isolate the DNA. This is a brand new platform that we got a grant for. And the DNA is then analyzed using uh, specialized DNA marker chips. These chips can read off uh, tens of thousands of specific positions in the genome. So we don't have to sequence the entire genome. If we start going to large populations, we only have to look at selected positions. And we have developed such marker chips now for eucalyptus and pine trees. 
uh, with collaborators in Brazil and the USA. This is the same technology uh, that has been pioneered in uh, genomic breeding of dairy cattle internationally. Um, and we, we basically use that same technology for molecular breeding as we go into eucalyptus trees. So with that set of markers, we can then track all of the different, different genetic variants. And uh, what we can do is what is called genomic selection. This is a process where we can use the, the genetic makeup to predict the, the genetic merit and the breeding value of individual trees. And this approach can really accelerate uh, molecular breeding uh, because this selection can be done at seedling level. We only need a leaf, this from each of the trees at the seeding level. And then uh, we can predict uh, traits that normally for tree breeding, we would have had to wait many years for those traits to be expressed at the maturity of the tree. So besides uh, genome assisted breeding, there are many other practical applications for growers and for breeders. The FNG program has over the past decade offered a DNA marker service to South African forestry companies. And during this time, this team of trained technicians have produced DNA marker profiles for over 60,000 eucalyptus and pine trees. And this represents the majority of forest breeding germplasm in the country. And now have a DNA profile, we can identify the tree. We can use this even for forensic purposes if there's a theft of trees. And uh, of course, it can be used for routine quality control of breeding uh, steps. So for instance, if we look at the main um, applications, we can do identification of trees. Uh, this is also important when you're working with clonal varieties to make sure that you have clonal integrity. We can do parentage analysis. We can reconstruct the pedigree of a tree if we know the candidate parents. We can uh, verify the species identification, uh, identity of the tree, and also uh, what kind of hybrid combination uh, is in that tree. And this turns out to be extremely important to the industry because um, in, in the context of how uh, tremendously expensive it would be if you were to be either crossing or propagating or deploying the wrong genotypes into the wrong environments. So I can mention with this um, platform that we have, the, the robotics platform, at 50,000 trees per year, we'd only be running at 25% of the capacity. So much of this can still be offered to other uh, tree and food crops. So finally, I, I uh, want to talk about a step change in terms of our understanding of how tree genomes interact with the environment. Uh, this is a new field called landscape genomics in which we aim to identify genomic regions that are involved in the responses of trees to changing environments. So on the slide there, I show examples, just a linear representation of the genome and you can see trees that, that are adapted and growing in areas where they are more red, they, they say red, is more drought uh, tolerant, you can identify ge regions of the genome that might be imparting that. So this is a new multidisciplinary field that involves integration of large amounts of data from genome analysis to tree testing, field testing, phenomics, spatial analysis, drone technologies to monitor trees um, and the environment at landscape level. So the ultimate aim would be to identify genotypes that will be best adapted to these different environments. In the context of rapid climate change, this will be very important because we will, um, in the future, we will have to breed for future environments. So the take home messages I wanna leave you with are that tree breeding is firmly in the post-genomic era. We now have many tree genomes from many species and we will soon also within the next two years have here in South Africa, a genome sequences from academia um, uh, cultivars uh, this routine uh, genome sequencing that we're doing is allowing us to follow a personalized tree genomics approach. And uh, the high throughput robotic systems that we have now also allow us to go to much larger populations and to track uh, and select trees with the best genetic variation. So there are many other practical applications as well, as I said, DNA fingerprinting, parentage analysis, ancestry mapping, and genome assisted breeding. And this will really accelerate the domestication and improvement of tree genomes. So finally, I'll leave you with a question, who will be uh, the first to implement these breeding technologies for the South African macadamia industry? To implement these technologies, you really need active breeding programs and close collaboration between breeders and molecular geneticists. And with that, I will stop and thank you. Good, I will take some questions.
So first question is, how long do you think it would take for similar services to be available to the macadamia genome uh, or industry? So uh, the answer for that is that the genome sequencing will be done this year and next year. So we will have a full genome sequence by then. And also for the DNA markers, uh, we can implement, we have already, Mary has already implemented a set of DNA markers that can be used for DNA fingerprinting and parentage. There's a second question about, um, about SNP markers. So these SNP markers are these SNP chips, the marker chips that I described uh, during my talk. Um, to, do, to develop those kind of chips for macadamia, we would have to sequence many macadamia genomes because we need to understand the variation in, uh, in, at population level, but it would certainly be possible. The point is just if we if we do develop such uh, chips, we do need active breeding programs. So my challenge again to the to the um, industry is who is going to to do that active molecular active breeding and apply molecular tools. Then there's a question. Um, let me just see a new question that has come in about the eucalyptus breeding program. Um, when we select our preferred traits, we cross them, but there's no certainty that that cross uh, results will have the traits now switched on or, uh, and, or on after crossing, we will still have to grow the tree out to maturity. Yes, okay, so this is the, um, the, um, the caution that any plant breeder will tell you, we still will have to grow those trees to check that they will be adapted to the environment. And this is gonna be especially important as environments change. The, um, the importance of molecular breeding is that we can already stack the cards towards um, deploying or, put, or testing only the base genotypes in uh, field trials um, for breeding purposes. I think that's all the questions.